Oh, local scandal, impeachment, new super, we're busy. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Takeo Comfort Solutions. Hardly a moment to waste. Blake Filippi is back. He is now, well, we should announce him as the new co-host of Dan York State of Mind. He literally has been in here, I think, three times in the last 10 working days. Uh, but as long as he keeps uh, doing some good government stuff and breaking a little bit of news, why not, right? Uh, his lawsuit has the State House running through a combination of and oh my gosh and I can't believe he did that and the Speaker of the House acting out a little bit and we'll chronicle that for you it's a pleasure to have you aboard you know when Kobe Bryant news came down this weekend it was just uh, we, this is gonna be one of those where were you when you heard it type of things and I was literally in a sandwich shop in downtown Providence with my wife having a casual Sunday when the kid behind the counter says to another kid Hey, Kobe Bryant died. And I'm, you know, munching on my roast beef sandwich thinking, did I hear that right? And I listened and I went to my phone and there they are, all these updates. I mean, if you are checked into your phone, right, and you subscribe to X number of news agencies, it's hardly going to be too much time between that which happens and you knowing about it. It's just, it was just a stunner. And I think the whole world is just stunned stunned and it's so deep and his daughter being involved but let's not forget in God's eyes there are nine equal lives on that helicopter uh, and all of them have a story all of them have a story but the profundity of losing Kobe Bryant in the sports world and in the NBA and in basketball in general is is almost unspeakably large so we'll uh, we'll deal with it as a society and Godspeed and prayer and it reminds us, you know, oh, it brings everything into perspective. If one person says that more, I think I'm just going to. But it is a cliche that at least you could at least move to this place. Like, every day matters. And maybe that is the perspective. In the meantime, uh, let's, uh, let's just check in on this Bolton bombshell. You know what? Before we call it a bombshell, let's just, you know, let's just stay calm. But certainly buoys the idea that Republicans are going to have a very difficult time not calling witnesses this week. Here's what the network had at press time in midday. Lawyers for President Trump are set to resume their defense Monday, even as a new report seems to undercut one of their arguments. There is simply no evidence anywhere that President Trump ever linked security assistance to any investigation. But a manuscript from former National Security Advisor John Bolton's upcoming book seems to challenge that assertion. According to the New York Times, Bolton writes that the president told him he wanted to continue freezing $391 million in security assistance to Ukraine until officials there helped with investigations into Democrats, including the Bidens. The president denied the allegation, tweeting this morning, if John Bolton said this, it was only to sell a book. Democrats immediately insisted Bolton be called as a witness. If he was in the room when this uh, went down, we need to know that. The, the American people need to know that. Four Republicans would have to break ranks to join Democrats voting to call new witnesses. At least one of them seems open to it. But I think at this stage it's pretty fair to say that uh, John Bolton has a uh, relevant uh, testimony to provide to those of us who are sitting in impartial justice. Bolton has already told lawmakers he is willing to testify. Uh, you have been refreshingly objective about this process. I think it was only in your last co-host role here that you... Welcome, by the way. Good to see you. Good to be here. I mean, you said, let's call the witnesses. Sure. You said it last week. Let's bring them on. By the Bidens, Bolton, I, I don't mind. I just want to remind you, you are the Republican minority leader in the state. Correct. Just in case you were scoring at home. Correct. You know, not too many people of your political brand who would so quickly and openly say that. So I gave you credit last time. Give me a couple minutes on this at max because you and I can get on. We've got a much more important story to be talking about tonight. Um, but your take is on this what? It goes back to what I said, I think, the fourth time ago I was here. Everything comes down to Trump's intent. 
it's Trump's intent underlying all of his actions, and they may not have been the best actions. He could have done things differently. If his intent was to get to the bottom of what he saw as a crime in the prior administration, he sails free. No problem whatsoever. If his intent was to affect our domestic political process, he has a problem. And so? Call the witnesses. Put it all on the table. Call Joe and Hunter yeah. Biden. Call John Bolton. You have to admit it. This is... Did you watch House of Cards? No. You never watched House of Cards? The first season. Well, all right. It gives you a flavor. This is a House of Cards episode. All of a sudden, the Bolton manuscript becomes, becomes available through what source, who knows <laughs> what. Uh, but it's, you can't ignore it. Right? You can't ignore it. So, uh, any guess as to what your national comrades are going to do? Are they going to vote it? I, I'm not going to venture to guess. Nobody knows. Idea. Nobody knows. But they should. They should vote it. I think uh, to have witnesses? Yes. Yeah, I think they should have witnesses. Yeah. I'm not afraid of witnesses. Be, but I'm not afraid of facts. What it may end up doing is taking this thing into uh, a year from now. Just for process and executive privilege and everything else that's going to be claimed, called for, and put up as an obstacle, so we'll I, see. I mean, the ultimate jurors are going to be in November. Yeah. That's the way I look Well, I, I, you know, if you call for witnesses, we may not be done by November, is my point. But who knows? We'll see. Uh, in the meantime, if we can just uh, make this little note, we have a new superintendent of the Providence Schools. He was announced today. I was at that press conference. He said something that I thought was kind of profound. Change happens at the speed of trust. I acknowledge that. And I just asked for the opportunity <coughs> to build your trust and earn your confidence. But we've got a lot of work to do. And I understand it starts with trust. But I will be a superintendent that values community. I will be a superintendent that knows the importance of school. I thought that was pretty cool. I, I, I got to look that up. Haven't had time today. Change happens at the speed of trust true. Uh, trust is something that is built, doesn't come packaged in, especially with the Providence City School situation, right? So we'll, uh, we'll see how that all comes down. The one thing, though, if you've been around a while, you'll know is that the big-time politicians, the governor included, like to win the press conference. You know how NCAA coaches uh, and, and athletic directors, you know, when they have a bad athletic program, football, basketball, uh, it's all about the next press conference and the next hire, you know, who they brought in to write the ship. This is very much the same thing. And the press conferences go away, and then the real work has to be done at the speed of trust. Uh, I'm told that we will have this new super in here uh, momentarily when he arrives in February, and stay tuned for that. In the meantime, let us go to the headline that had a lot of people chatting last week. The Convention Southern Authority said they're not going to comply with an audit from the Auditor General, who works for the General Assembly, who began to set the pace for the audit based on the reported order of the Speaker of the House. This is what they did in a morning meeting last week. Auditor General shall have the power when requested by a majority of the committee to make post audits and performance audits of accounts and records of any other public body uh, based on that law, I would make a motion that we not comply with this audit request from the Auditor General until uh, there is a majority vote of the Joint Committee on Legislative Services. So that came as a result of your lawsuit, which came after the Speaker had ordered the audit, which I have learned came after the Speaker had his guys issue a threat to the Convention Authority. And I'm not sure that enough of that. Listen, everyone knows that based on those who've worked the story, and I've worked it hard over the last couple of days. It's a uh, it's a background, deep background piece of information, not something that has made the headlines, so to speak, right? So the speaker has this uh, friend, uh, former state police captain uh, James Demers, who was the head of security uh, at the convention center, who has a personnel problem, the human resources problem of, of, of seeming significance. Uh, and it was that problem that the 
representatives of the speaker uh, reportedly came at least once, perhaps on a number of occasions, to say, hey, listen, fix this. Fix this, or you're going to get an enema. Well, I guess the audit's the enema. And that's where you came in. Give me your 30 seconds on this, and then we'll recapture the entire story when we come back. So we, we came in the House Minority Caucus and filed a lawsuit because the speaker did not comply with the law in filing for the audit. The law that no one complies with, which is part of your systemic change, perhaps. It's, it's part of a systemic problem that we are going to fix, and that is that the speaker has been exercising unilateral control over the State House when it needs to be decided by the Joint Committee on Legislative Services, and he's usurped that authority and we are going to fix it. All right, when we come back, you'll learn what the JCLS is. At least this will be a good government lesson for you, I hope. Stay with us. So this is most of the story. And by the way, Target 12, Ted Nisi, Tim White are the um, journalistic instigators of this story, meaning they did the groundwork. On Friday afternoon, Rhode Island Convention Center executives sent this letter to the colonel of the Rhode Island State Police, noting they were, quote, recently threatened with an audit. They go on to request a formal investigation by the state police into the nexus of this request, the motivation behind it, and if any laws were broken in the process. Target 12 first revealed last week that House Speaker Nicholas Mattiello, Rhode Island's most powerful lawmaker, had ordered the unusual audit. The request immediately raised eyebrows around the State House because it coincided with a personnel investigation into two senior convention center executives, one of them Mattiello's friend, James Demers. What was your first reaction when you got the letter? My first reaction was that they were, it was in relationship to the, what's going on with Demers and, and uh, Amanda, and uh, that they were reacting negatively because we had done something that they didn't agree with. Mattiello denies the audit was an attempt to protect Demers, insisting he was simply concerned about the facility's finances. But during an appearance on last weekend's edition of Newsmakers, the speaker also acknowledged he took an interest in his friend's situation. Did you or anyone from your office or the JCLS discuss the Demers matter with anyone from the convention center, the authority, or its board? Uh, I, I inquired of one person and I was told that it was basically a personnel matter and I had no other involvement with that. You're laughing. I'm laughing because you're laughing. No, Listen, a, a, I think you laughed on your own. A, a, a lot comes down to Speaker Mattiello's intent. Almost the same analysis we did 10 minutes ago with Trump. If Speaker Mattiello's intent was to respond to information about the convention center that he received, financial issues, as he states, and that's why he did what he did, then I don't think he has a problem. But if his intent was political retribution, I think he does have a problem. Right. So this is a messy one. Yeah. It's a messy one because the play-by-play -play on this comes from Pluto in the sense the irony is, Republicans, back to your predecessor Patricia Morgan, have been arguing that the convention center is a place that needs an audit, uh, maybe not an enema, but an audit, to take a look at its performance. The high political drama that she brought to the table on this whole thing, by the way, was interestingly quelled. Uh, and by the way, it was pretty coincidental with a $50,000 rehab of the minority leader's office, which was not lost on me back in the day. All of a sudden, guess what? During my predecessor. Correct. So, you know, all due respect to Patty, she wants to come in here and explain herself on that one. I'd be happy to talk to her about that. With that being said, our offices were in deplorable condition. They, Got need, you. they needed to be updated. Got you. And you shouldn't be begging for crumbs. But once the crumbs were distributed, it seemed to me like that thing calmed down a little bit. Having said that, she raised these, these, these grand concerns about the convention center. And by the way, you should know, it's the Dunkin' Donuts Center. It's, 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 it's both buildings. It's the same thing. I mean, they're all in the same business. Now, look, I've never thought, I don't know what your point of view is on this, I never thought that those businesses had to be profit centers. They are economic stimulus. I think they are lost leaders. I'd like to see them run the top shape efficiently and alike, but is it your position that those, uh, do you hold the Republican position that the convention center ought to be per and a profit? I think it should be having less red. 
I think when you look at the number of events they have compared to comparable convention centers, they're down. Compared to Hartford, for instance, has many more events. I think we need more events. I think it's a very be. competitive business. It's Agreed. a cutthroat business. Providence is a great place. And to have just conventions. like, by the way, you, I give you credit on a bunch of things lately. I mean, you are on a good government role, and you ought to be credited for that. On the AGT Twin River thing, you said, you know what? I don't know enough about this. By the way, that's a big story that's still pretty. Maybe you'll give me an update at the end of the show. But at least you said on that one, you know what? I don't get this business. Let's bring in consultation. You don't get the convention business either. So before, you know, opponents wax on about non-performance, I think a, a competitive analysis of the marketplace and the internal operations of that authority probably ought to take place. Yeah, I still support an audit. Okay, well, no, I'm talking about a market exam, a strategic exam as opposed to just an audit. Uh, having said that, sometimes they are the same thing. Uh, having said that, it is ironic that the speaker never lifted a finger for that. Republicans are looking for it, and we now find our place at the end of this chapter, at least, <laughs> where you guys are saying, sorry, we can't do an audit now, and he's going, what's the matter? Where's the audit? And by the way, the Providence Journal's op-ed piece today, uh, actually it's editorial, which dismisses this lawsuit you have and all the other saga involved with this as like a political circus. Uh, I have to say this right now. The Providence Journal's editorial board ought to be embarrassed for its water carrying for this speaker. Uh, and you know what? Maybe someone ought to do an investigation on that. Because if you follow the bouncing ball of lobby money, former managerial positions, and influence, I mean, this story with today's editorial is becoming the full Rhode Island, if it isn't, isn't already. I don't know if you have a thought on that, but they whacked, they whacked the concept that this was a real problem, other than the authority needs to be audited. They carry the speaker's water on this. I'm going to take Buddy Cianci's advice and not pick fights with those that buy ink by the barrel. I will say I disagree with them. Process matters, and it seems like the editorial disregards the, the process, the bad process here, yeah, well, in favor of an outcome. I, I, I think the journal does great work on uh, X number of occasions, but the editorial board there, uh, and Mr. Acorn can come in here anytime he wants. You know that. Open book. It's pr it is problematic. Here's the thing. In response to that, who, who killed the audit last week? The speaker killed the, the audit. The speaker killed the audit. So if you were a phony baloney and all the concerns around this thing were phony baloney, you just move ahead with the audit. If the audit's so important, but now the audit's not so important. Why? Because you filed a lawsuit about the process of that. And when we come back, we'll talk about that and what will be learned, not only with this story, which is catalytic, but the system itself. Stay with us. Did you violate the statute by ordering the audit? No. We always operate through the chairman, like every board across the country We should does. point out you're the chairman. I'm the chairman of the committee. I inquired of one person, and I was told that it was basically a personnel matter, and I had no other involvement with that. All right, racing quickly here. The Speaker of the House has a pal who he says is an honorable guy, former captain of the state police. Uh, what is alleged in this uh, human resources problem is anything but honorable. So we ought to take a look at that, but they'll have their day. Uh, reportedly, both those people have been canned from the convention authority. I don't know whether that's been formally announced or not, but I'm t told that's where it was going. Uh, and we'll see what happens with that. Uh, but the idea that the speaker acted on his own chairman authority this will, this will be a civics lesson for Rhode Islanders, right? The JCLS is the Joint Committee on Legislative Services. It's on paper. It's on paper. It's five people on, it's, it's supposed to meet and operate, but really it's been a theory more than anything else. It's the operating engine of the General Assembly. It is the Speaker of the House, his minority leader, a Democrat, the majority leader. majority leader, and the minority leader. Two Democrats and a Republican, and the Senate has the Senate President and its minority leader. There are five people on the board, and the House has three representatives, it's really been more, it's not been, it's not been a Democratic-Republican battle over the course of time. The Senate has complained that it doesn't have enough power on it because it has two members versus three. So it's been a point of contention about how to run the show. And it goes all the way down from, should we buy a cell phone or a pencil for the staff? Or should we hire a lawyer? Or should we uh, continue with the legislative grant program? Or should we paint the rooms? Or should we 
who order gets an audits. office or order an audit who gets their office taken away because they don't vote, vote the right way ah. who gets staff or doesn't get staff right. who gets what parking space and it's space. met i'm told it's met no more than two times say in the last 15 20 years I, that's what I thought. I watched my predecessor's one of her interviews this weekend, and she said that they had met, I think, in 2016 at a bar. And I don't know what's worse, not meeting or having a meeting at a bar. I'm not sure if that qualifies as a quorum, but here's the point. Uh, your lawsuit says, hey, you went ahead and ordered an audit without my consent, so you're bothered by that. Give me a short answer on that. Without a doubt. But long term, you may just get an improvement of the operations of the JCLS, that things become a whole lot more formal, and the chairman, by culture, doesn't make all these decisions. I mean, in part, you can hardly blame Nick Mattiello. If his intent was, was if he had malintent, you can throw a lot of blame on him. If it was just kind of like, hey, it's the way we do business. I'm the chairman. I ordered the audit. What's the matter with you? That's a structural problem that you can fix without everyone talking about state police, jail, and all that kind of a thing. I exactly. And, and I want to say that, I had gone to the speaker and asked him to please call a meeting to legitimize this. Belligerently so, he says. And you are belligerent. I'm a very belligerent man sometimes, not in this instance. Um, I had gone to him and asked him to call the meeting I to want legitimize to this. I've audit. never seen the guy belligerent. I've been, I know you're trying to, I, I, you know, we all have a, a way, but you, you assert that you were not belligerent. I was you not, assert that he's making that up. Listen, does the speaker and I have passionate conversations sometimes? Yes. Did we have it that night? Yes. I don't believe that belligerence would describe it. All right. Um, that's either here nor there. The, the important thing is that I was rejected when I asked him to call a meeting of JCLS to legitimize this audit to have a vote. And that was the impetus for our lawsuit. And our lawsuit isn't just about this one act. Our lawsuit is attacking the speaker's interpretation of the law that he Which is why you is didn't withdraw the lawsuit. The because, because he withdrew the audit, you, not, you, you did not withdraw the lawsuit because the lawsuit's bigger than just the audit. So our motion for temporary restraining order, emergency injunction, became moot at the point that he withdrew the audit. The underlying legal questions about the speaker's authority of chairman exist, right. and the lawsuit will carry on. But this, 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 the state police has been requested by the convention authority to formally investigate this. I am sure that they are. Uh, I only got a minute here. Uh, Representative John Lombardi, who is an opposition guy on the Democrats, uh, wondered out loud whether or not the speaker was going to survive this on my radio program on Friday. You talked about this being problematic when you heard me tell, you, tell the world that a couple of uh, representatives went in there and made the threat. Uh, what is your tea leaf read of where this is going to be this week and beyond with the speaker? I mean, I, the, more facts need to come out. If there were threats, if there were political retributions, like I said on your radio show, I have very deep concerns about the speaker's ability to lead the body. The body. If there weren't threats and it was a mistake just not coming to JCLS, I don't have that same high level of concern. All right. Uh, it's a stay tuned. Thanks for your work. Final word in waking back. Yeah. So look, this story on the convention center is serious business. And don't buy for a minute that the muscle wasn't used here. And don't buy for a minute that the speaker is wholly committed to the idea that he wants to see where the bodies are buried at the center authority, the convention center authority. Because the way the culture is around here, I'm sure he's had a significant role in putting them there, if they're there. Uh, do they need to be reviewed? Yes. More stringently? Maybe. But not this way. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Bye.